So when we look at our own galaxy's rotation curve, we found that it didn't look like the rotation curve for the solar system, right? And in fact, Vera Rubin measured this same sort of rotation curve for the Andromeda galaxy in 1968. And she was able to show that dark matter does seem to make up about 95% of not only our galaxy, but other galaxies as well. So at this point, many rotation curves have been measured. The ones that you saw in the lab, those were all from Vera Rubin's paper. Um, and it kind of begs the question, why is there dark matter everywhere? And what is it if it's not stuff that we see? So um, what we do know is that the dark matter seems to be distributed in a spherical halo. This is the model that best reproduces our observations. So the observations for galaxy NGC 3198 here are shown with the, the black dots or different measurements of speed with the error bars shown. Um, and the black curve is the best fit to that data. And then if we only consider the disk, the matter from visible stars for this galaxy, we would get a, a, a curve like the purple one here that looks like the rotation curve for a solar system. But if we include the halo in the observations, it will make up the extra dark matter needed to match the data. By putting both of these two curves together, you can reproduce the black curve. So um, it's by looking at data like this and seeing what uh, models are required to best fit the data um, that we know that dark matter is in a spherical halo. Okay, so what the heck is this stuff, right? There's a bunch of ideas for what it could be. Maybe it's stars that are really dim or maybe they're hidden behind a dust cloud so we don't see them, so we're not accounting for all of them. Or maybe it's gas that we're not picking up on. Uh, maybe it's neutron stars. Some of them, uh, they do emit radiation, but not all of them emit radiation that points in our direction, as we talked about in Astronomy 122. Or maybe there's black holes out there and we can't see them because they're not emitting light. So dark matter could be any of these things, um, but some of these are less likely than others. So both neutron stars and black holes come from the uh, remains of dead stars. So they're basically the cores of stars. Um, neutron stars are ones that have generally gone supernova, so have black holes. So the rest of the dust and gas from their outer layers has been flung back into space, but their core becomes this either very dense neutron star or infinitely dense black hole. Um, so some of the problems with these is that we should be able to see these things in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And even if we can't see them in our own galaxy, right, because it's hard to look through the disk, well, we should at least be able to see them in other galaxies like Andromeda that we see face on. So if there were some sort of stars in Andromeda that we weren't counting, it doesn't really make sense why we wouldn't be able to see those when we're looking at Andromeda face on. The same kind of problem comes from gas. Um, and as for neutron stars and black holes, they do emit some radiation, so we can measure their presence. Um, it's not necessarily that black holes emit x-rays, but as we'll see, the accretion disks around black holes do emit x-rays. We'll talk about that next time. So it doesn't really stand to reason that dark matter could be anything uh, normal that we think of. Um, so maybe it's dust, right? Maybe it's the dust that's blocking our view, and maybe we're just not able to count it properly. Um, but this would also cause the light from distant galaxies to be dimmer. Right? So if there's some sort of dust that we're not accounting for in our own Milky Way, well, then we, we should at least know of its presence, right? Based on what we see from other galaxies. Um, there are objects called white dwarfs. These are stellar remnants and brown dwarfs. These are basically failed stars, things that are bigger than a Jupiter, but smaller than a sun. Um, and this is one of the main contenders for what dark matter could be. These do emit radiation um, brown dwarfs emit in the infrared, white dwarfs um, emit at, well, they start out in the visible and then they make their way toward the infrared over time. And this is uh, a class of objects called massive compact halo objects. So they would be massive objects made of normal stuff that we're used to. 
um, and they're just hard to measure the radiation from. So our massive compact halo objects. Um, the white dwarfs have masses similar to the sun's mass. So if you imagined there was, you know, an equivalent amount of kind of white dwarfs and, black and brown dwarfs out there, um, then maybe we could add up to something similar to the amount of the disk, right? Um, brown dwarfs are failed stars, like I said, and they're less massive than the sun's mass. So if we just assume that maybe there's an equivalent number of white dwarfs and brown dwarfs out there as there are regular stars, then you could see, okay, well, maybe there's, you know, 100% to 110% more mass that could be accounted for in this way. But that only takes us from two times 10 to the 11 solar masses to four times 10 to the 11 solar masses, not to six, right? So it doesn't quite add up to how much we would actually need. Um, okay, so these things would be hard to detect, but it's possible that we could detect them. Uh, one of the methods for measuring massive objects that are not emitting a lot of light on their own is that the light coming from them from a distant star could travel past the object and get bent by the object. So these rays of light that are, um, as we'll talk about, going through its gravitational well would actually be bent. And so we would see um, kind of a smeared out appearance from stars if this object were in the way. So this is one way that we can measure brown dwarfs. All right. So again, this is kind of a concept that relies on general relativity. So we'll talk about it again on Wednesday. Uh, this whole process is called gravitational lensing. And we do see gravitational lensing of uh, galaxies by mass, uh, like galaxy clusters in deep space, but we don't really see this effect much within our own Milky Way. All right. Um, why is it hard to detect macho radiation? So the brown dwarfs emit, uh, well, they're, for one thing, they're just very low mass objects. And so even though they are emitting in the infrared, it's just, they're, they're small objects, so they're hard to detect. White dwarfs are very small objects as well. So theoretically, you could detect them in the infrared. Um, in practice, you're going to see a lot more radiation from stars, and that's going to wash these objects out. OK, so this has not been ruled out. But there's a more exotic idea as well. And that's that there's some sort of subatomic particle that we have not yet found that, it, that is just out there in large quantity that accounts for dark matter. So this is, as opposed to machos, WIMPs. And WIMPs stands for weakly interacting massive particles. Um, the reason we call this weakly interacting massive particles is because we know they're massive. We know they contain mass because they contribute to what we see in our rotation curves but they're weakly interacting, meaning that they don't interact with light. So in order to understand what the candidate particles are, we have to turn to the standard model of particle physics. So you might've heard of particle physics before. Um, there are various subatomic particles that make up atoms. Um, some of these are fermions, so they're matter particles. There's the quarks. These add together to make protons and neutrons. And then there's leptons like the electron, which, um, orbits the nucleus of an atom. And then it has two heavier cousins, the muon and the tau. And then there are also neutrinos. Um, these are objects that don't interact very strongly with matter, but they do occasionally. So we've detected neutrinos. And there's also three uh, versions of the neutrino, um, the electron, the muon, and the tau. They're just named the same way as the electrons. So there's all these matter particles, these make up atoms, and then the neutrinos are produced from um, nuclear reactions. And then we have some kind of weird particles called bosons. And these are basically just um, how the matter particles interact with each other. So you could imagine the matter particles as playing catch with the bosons, and that's how they um, you know, go through their game of particle physics. So there's a bunch of types. Uh, you might have heard of the Higgs boson that was detected in the last few years. Um, the photon, of course, is our light particle. 
and then there's W and Z bosons and the gluons. So the photon, this is the one that interacts with lots of other matter. And this is how we are able to, you know, detect things from around us by um, having the photon interact with materials like the CCDs in a camera and thereby get information from the last thing that they interacted with, right? So if you like to think of it that way, the photon is an object that's been sort of, it's like a baton that's been traded off from matter to matter. So the photon is, carries information about the last matter it interacted with, and then it interacts with the matter in our cameras. And this is what we mean by interacting, all right? So it's possible that WIMPs are particles out there that don't interact very well with the photon. And that's why we can't see them because if the photon doesn't interact with that matter, then it doesn't carry that imprint to us. All right, so what could these be? It could be that there's a supersymmetric set of particles that basically mirror the standard model um, and they don't interact with light, but they do have mass. Um, so there's an entire branch of um, particle theory that is devoted to supersymmetry and there are active searches for the supersymmetry particles going on at the LHC. Um, so that's uh, the collaboration behind the LHC is called CERN. It's located in Europe between the border of Switzerland and France. I have friends who work there and I went and visited them. It's a good place to go visit. They have a really cool visitor center. And also you can go to the control room for um, the different experiments and push buttons to make lights flash. It's really fun. All right, so those are all the ideas that we had that are made of mass. Um, but maybe, like I said before, maybe it's true that Kepler and Einstein or, and Newton were wrong and our understanding of how uh, gravity works is wrong. Uh, so this is actually another active area of research. This is called MOND and that stands for Modified Newtonian Dynamics. So what we've been looking at so far is Newtonian dynamics, um, but maybe there's a modification to Newton's laws that would explain dark matter. So, you know, it's possible that this difference is not made up by a difference in mass, but by an error in the models. Um, so we'd throw out all of this idea about mass being the culprit and instead say, gravity is wrong. And specifically, the idea is that on close distances, like within our solar system, um, we see that the rotation curve matches our expectations. And so maybe at close distances, gravity is right, right? Newton's universal law applies, but maybe at really long distances, it behaves differently and we need to use a different um, form for the force. So there are lots of different theories out there and some of them make predictions that can be tested, but so far they tend to make incorrect predictions. So, so far it doesn't seem like MOND is uh, particularly successful. One of the big uh, predictions that they fail at is what happens when galaxies merge together and collide through each other. So we can measure using gravitational lensing of different background galaxies um, the arrangement of the mass that's shaded in blue. And then um, the predictions that MOND makes uh, doesn't match what, um, what we actually observe here in the bullet cluster. But the idea of the, the wimps of there being large um, massive halos of mass that doesn't interact with light, that does match our observations here. So it seems like the actual presence of mass is most likely um, and that this modification to Newtonian dyna dynamics is just not going to cut it. 